right, let me ask you guys a question. Do you guys remember when y'all were little kids, like maybe in kindergarten, you would have to do these puzzles or worksheets that had like several different objects on it, and you would have to decide which object didn't belong. Do you guys remember doing stuff like this when y'all were younger? This is stuff that we are currently working on with our kindergartner at home. We're, we're doing these things at some of his homework that he has to do. But if you forgot what these look like, check out this. I have an example here on the screen. Which item doesn't belong on the screen? Which one? Just yell it out. One at coordinates two, two. The green. Green does not belong, okay, because everything else is red. All right. All right. Next one, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. Let's see. Which one does not belong? Uh, one at the coordinates two, two. two. All right, first off, for those of you that are saying tacos, tacos always belong. The correct answer is Coke because yeah. everything else is food. It feels Pepsi, maybe Pepsi belong, but yeah, it's not the burger. The burger belongs, hot dog, wings, ribs, tacos. Tacos, who said tacos don't belong? I said they belong. Clearly, you're offensive to every Mexican. Man. You see, puzzles and, and activity sheets and stuff like this, man, it's all fun and games until it becomes personal. You have that feeling, and here's what I mean by it gets personal. You, you ever get that feeling? That it's a really discouraging feeling that, that you just don't belong? Have you ever felt like an outcast? Maybe you had a moment where, where you walked into a room and it just felt like you didn't belong there. For me, I, I remember several times in my life where, where this had happened. One of those times happened my very first week of college. Uh, when, I, when I went to college at Roanoke Bible College up in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, now known as Mid-Atlantic Christian University, I didn't know a soul there. I drove 500 miles. I never set foot on campus. Uh, so I had no idea what the campus looked like. But everybody else here, they for the most part knew each other. They grew up together. They grew up going to church camp together. They grew up going to the conferences and the retreats and the conventions. Uh, most of them grew up on, on the uh, North Carolina coast or in southeast Virginia in that Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. And here I am coming from Georgia up to northeast North Carolina. I didn't know a soul. I did not feel like I fit in at all, especially that first week. And ultimately, while I might have felt like an outcast then, ultimately we all want to feel like we belong, right? And it, it can be hard when we don't feel like we belong. And tonight we're going to look at scripture, and it's going to show us how someone who didn't belong, who was an outcast, was able to live a powerful, God-ordained life. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we, we've looked at this verse to start every session um, this month with this series, and we're going to do it one more time. We're going to look at it, and we're going to continue looking at it with a different translation this week from the translation NIV, and this is what it says. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Next slide. There we go. Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So each week in this series, we have talked about these cloud of witnesses, this crowd, this huge crowd of witnesses, depending on what translation you're looking at. And, and what they have is that they have walked this road of life, of faith, this journey of faith, like we're walking now. And they've done so with great success. And they've dealt with the challenges that have came along their way. And so, but who are these people? In our final week of the series, we're going to take a look, we're going to take a look at the life of someone uh, who is one of these witnesses who started out as an outcast and ended up a hero for her entire family. So we're going to do what we've done the previous weeks. We're going to back up one chapter. And we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. This is what it says. By faith, Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. Now, Rahab is a prostitute who is one of the witnesses in the cloud of witnesses. But why is she here? What, what does she do? What makes her so special? You see, Rahab is introduced to us in the book of Joshua. And she lived in a city called Jericho. And as we just mentioned, she, she 
did not have the best of career choices. She was an outcast in her own society by the nature of her profession. And she is also didn't belong with the people of God because she was not an Israelite. But make no mistake about it, Rahab was an unlikely hero. You see, as the Israelites approached Jericho, Joshua sent in uh, a couple spies to gather information on the city. And these spies saw refuge in Rahab's house because it was conveniently located near the city walls. When the king of Jericho learned this about the presence of the Israelite spies at Rahab's house, he sent a message demanding that she hand them over. However, Rahab, man, she displayed incredible courage by hiding the spies on the roof and deceiving the king's men. You see, Rahab declared her faith and her assistance with the Israelite spies, and they made her a promise. They assured her that the Israelites, when they conquered Jericho, that she and her family would be spared, provided they remain in her house, marked with a scarlet cord. So sure enough, Jericho was conquered. In an epic scene where, where the city walls of Jericho, man, they, they just came down. In Rahab's house, marked by that, by that scarlet cord, was was saved. And Rahab became a part of the Israelite community. You see, she eventually married and is even mentioned in the lineage of King David. And as we read the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Matthew, we see Rahab's name mentioned in the family tree of Jesus. You see, Rahab's story is a testament to her bravery, her faith, and redemption. Despite her unconventional profession, she played a crucial role in the Israelites' conquest of Jericho and is remembered as a woman of great faith. Now, this one woman who, who probably felt like an outcast probably her entire life, she chose to believe in God. She saved her entire family and she's in, like I said, the family tree of Jesus. That means because of her faith, God grafted her into the divine story of salvation that is for all of us. So what about Rahab can we learn tonight at Axios? Well, it starts that, that Rahab was obedient to God. See, Rahab didn't let her status in society keep her from, from being obedient to God. You see, Rahab fully recognized that God is all-powerful. And that the people of Jericho, man, they had heard stories about the Israelites, about how God was with them as they defeated their enemies, about what God did to help the Israelites cross the Red Sea. You see, they had heard the stories. And Rahab had heard the stories as well. And Rahab's wanted to go all in with God. She confesses that God is a God of, in heaven and on earth, and she's asking God and the Israelites to show her kindness when they invade the city. Now, Rahab's background makes her faith even more remarkable because faith does not discriminate based on our past or social status. You see, there are going to be times in our lives where we are going to feel like an outcast, where we just don't belong. It is in those times, man, it can be hard to be obedient to God. Thankfully, thankfully we have the example of Rahab to remind us that through hard times, we can still be obedient to God. You see, in times of adversity, or when we feel like outcasts, maintaining obedience to God remains essential. Here's why this principle is so important. You see, God's character, His love, His faithfulness does not waver based on our circumstances or feelings. Even when we feel disconnected or out of place, God remains a constant and he remains reliable in our lives. Obedience to, to him is a way that we can anchor ourselves to his unchanging nature, to his unchanging truth and his presence. You see, the Bible is filled with promises of God's care, his guidance and provision for his people. When we obey God, when we obey God, we position ourselves to receive his promises as well. Even in the midst of, of, 
adversity. For example, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, I will never leave or abandon you. He promises to never give up on us. And this assurance can give us strength in difficult times. Now, obedience to God, obedience can be hard during hard times. And that can, but when we do that, it can also lead to spiritual growth. It deepens our trust in God and strengthens our faith. When we choose to obey his word and follow his guidance, we become more resilient. We become better equipped to navigate challenges. Now, our obedience to God during difficult times can also serve as a very powerful tool to witness to other people. When people see us remaining faithful to God and his principles, despite any adversity that is going on in our life, it can inspire other people to seek out that relationship with Jesus himself because then you're living a Christ-like lifestyle. You are inspiring other people to draw closer to God. And then we also need to keep things in perspective. You see, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. We are reminded that our ultimate citizenship is in heaven, and that helps us keep an eternal perspective. It helps us keep that eternal perspective so when we start to feel like outcasts of the world, we, we can find comfort in the knowledge that this is not our forever home. You see, our true identity and our belonging is in God and in God's eternal kingdom. Now, small groups. Man, you guys know how much I love small groups. Small groups are very important. It is essential. And our small groups here in the C3 Student Ministry are made up of a community of believers that can provide support and encouragement to one another during difficult times. Man, I have seen our small groups um, meet to, uh, to help people build them up. And our small groups are meant to be a place where we can gather together to find that belonging and support each other as we journey in life together on our faith journey. You know, essentially, obedience to God during hard times is also an act of faith and trust. It is an acknowledgement that we may not fully understand our circumstances but we trust God's wisdom and we trust God's love. It's a declaration that we belong to a higher kingdom and a deeper identity in Christ. So when times are hard and you feel like an outcast, remember your obedience to God. That becomes a beacon of light in a very dark place for us drawing us closer to him and demonstrating our unwavering trust in his plans for our lives. Now, even though Rahab, she started off as, a, as an outcast, her obedience to God brought a blessing to her and her family and also all of us. You see, the bottom line for this week, the main point, if you don't hear anything else I say this week, I want you to hear this one sentence. Obedience to God brings a blessing no matter who you are. So how was Rahab blessed? Well, that's easy. One, her and her family were spared. And the second one, that she is a part of the family tree of Jesus. So what's another lesson we can learn from Rahab? Well, Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, he says this right here. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You see, in this verse, Jesus makes a very deep statement about the nature uh, of true blessings and the role of obedience. Jesus begins by emphasizing the, the act of hearing or, or listening to the Word of God. That involves not just a passive hearing, but an active and focused attention. It implies that an openness that we are open to receiving God's message and guidance through His Word. And the second part of that verse highlights the importance of not just hearing or keeping or obeying the word. I'm sorry, it's not just hearing, but it's also keeping and obeying the word. Obedience, man, it, it's a fundamental aspect of faith. It involves putting into practice what we've heard and what we've learned from God's word. You see, true faith is not merely an intellectual thing. It's also a practical thing. Jesus states that those who both hear and obey God's word 
then you're going to be blessed. Obedience to God commands, um, when we're obedient to God's commands, then it, it brings about a spiritual and eternal blessings that transcend earthly circumstances. So if obedience is key, then how is it done? Well, let's start with daily devotions. How many of you guys, and don't answer this out, I don't raise your hand or anything, but how many of you guys actually take time to do daily devotions? You take time out of your day to focus on God and His Word. I'm going to be honest, when I was your age, man, it was hard for me to set aside some time to, to read my Bible, to do a devotion. But devotions were not as easily as accessible as they are now. You see, I remember when I was a teenager, I knew what my priorities were. Yes, I was going to be at church anytime the doors were open. But that's about how I got my, my church fix on. But my priorities, honestly, it was girls, it was video games, it was friends. That was my priorities. As an adult, as I've gotten older, my priorities have shifted. My priorities have changed. You see, if something is important to you, then you're going to put a focus on it. You see, getting close to God through daily devotions, they are important to me. So one of the things that I try to do every day before I leave my office downstairs is I take my Bible and I will leave it right in front of my MacBook. Why do I do this? Because I want that to be the first thing I see when I sit down at my desk. I want the Word of God to be the first thing I do. Before I really get my day started, I put it right there in front of my MacBook so that that is the first thing I do every day. That is my daily devotion. I just started a brand new daily devotion yesterday where I'm going chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the book of Romans. Just read Romans chapter 2 today. And this is my devotion that I am doing right now. This is how I want to start my day off every single day. And I would challenge you to do the same thing. The next part is a lifestyle of obedience. You see, it's not just enough to hear the word, but we need to keep it. As you dive into the word daily, as you are diving into God's word every day, you need to keep what you read. Take what you're reading and apply it to your life. If your daily devotion, if you're doing something based on giving, then maybe you should step your giving up at church, whether it's your time, your energy, your talents, or even your money. If the devotion you're reading about is about forgiveness, maybe you need to, to seek forgiveness from God or from someone else, or maybe you're holding on to a grudge and you need to forgive someone else. Take what you're reading and put it into action. Make obedience to God a priority in your decision-making and actions. And then we need to seek God's blessings. Understand that God's blessings are not uh, primarily material or worldly, but encompass spiritual fulfillment, peace, joy in our lives, and the deep sense of His presence in our life. Strive for these blessings through His obedience and His Word. You see, Jesus is challenging us to not only be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. Man, Rahab, she certainly put into action what, what, what she knows about God. She was a doer. And her action spoke a lot louder than her words when she helped the Israelites. You see, Rahab's story, man, it's a powerful testament to the transformation power of faith in God's redeeming grace. It reminds us that faith is not limited to by our past, and God can use anyone who believes in him. Just as Rahab's faith led to her redemption, our faith in Jesus leads to our spiritual redemption and adoption into God's family. As we wrap up this series, I want you guys to know that Rahab's story is a reminder that our past does not define our future when we place our trust in God. As we wrap up this series, I want you to remember Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. We looked at this verse from four different translations over the last several weeks. We've gone back to this verse every single week, and it makes it clear that we need to strip off the things that weighs us down, that slows us down, that keeps us from getting close to God. We need to run the race, just like the witnesses before us have done so. Witnesses that range from the father of faith to the, to the deliverer of a generation, to the people that is God's people, and to an outcast that no one thought was worthy. 
God doesn't give up on us. It shows us, that the examples that we looked at, it shows us that anyone who obeys God and keeps their faith at a high level, then those people will run their race successfully. Obey God. Even when it doesn't make sense, it is always worth it. No matter how you lived up until this point in your life, I want you to know that God is offering a way right now for you to go home. Our eternal home is in heaven. He wants to craft your story into the fabric of his family. Some of you guys have made the decision before to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Some of you haven't made that decision. And if this is something you want to do, if you want to make a decision and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or if you've already accepted Jesus, but you've gotten off track and you need to rededicate your life, then come and talk to me afterwards tonight. Jesus is offering you a chance to live eternity with him. He's called you. If that's something you want to talk to me about afterwards, then talk to me after we're done tonight, okay? I'm here for you guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for tonight. I thank you for Rahab's incredible story. On It doesn't matter who we are, Lord, whether we're an outcast or not. You can use us. You welcome us. You redeem us. You forgive us, Lord. God, for, for all the students that we have in here tonight, Lord, if there are people that are questioning faith, if they're questioning whether or not that you can use them, remove that doubt from their lives, Lord. Let us all know you can use us. And so, God, use us. Use us to bring glory and honor to your kingdom. Help us grow your kingdom, God. We love you and your sons in my prayer. Amen. All right, guys, let's head to small groups tonight.